so this is where I'm supposed to say, Joan, thank you for that kind introduction. <laughs> okay, what a way to start out. Well, good morning to everyone. It is great to be back here at GeoInt. And Joan, thank you for that kind introduction. <laughs> a big thank you to Stu Shea, Keith Mosbach, and the USGIF Board of Directors, really for all that you do and for putting on just another fabulous GeoInt symposium. I hope you never get tired of hearing me say how fortunate we are at NGA to have a foundation that is all about the furthering of our business. So thanks for your leadership, thanks for your service, and thank you for everything that you do. A big thank you to DNI Clapper also. Sir, thank you for being here again this year. Thanks for your great remarks this morning, very kind words about NGA. We appreciate your support. I don't think there is anyone who knows as well as you do the power of GeoInt and who knows what we contribute every day to the security of our nation. So, sir, thanks for your continued support and appreciate you spending time here. This is a group of folks who are transforming GeoInt. The talent, the capabilities, the diversity that is in this room is exactly what we need to continue to propel us forward. I think given the opportunity, we can do just about anything. We help bring terrorists to justice. We support military operations from planning through execution. We safeguard lives in the aftermath of natural disaster. We are transforming GeoInt, and we are creating tomorrow's NGA today. In 2010, at my first GeoInt in New Orleans, I laid out the vision of putting the power of GeoInt in the hands of the user. Last year, I introduced a framework, four priorities that we need to achieve to drive us towards that vision. And those four priorities were providing easy, intuitive access to our content, creating a three-tiered customer service model, self-service, assisted service, and full service in an open IT environment, and deepening and broadening our analysis so that we could provide new value, create new value for our users, for our customers. And so what I thought I would do here today is tell you where we are, tell you about the progress that we've made, the challenges that we still have, as well as where you can help us. So, content. And when I say content, I'm talking about our products, our data, our knowledge. Raw data, even. It needs to be discoverable. You have to be able to find it. It's got to be accessible. You got to be able to get to it. And you have to be able to use it. Easily usable. And so we set about making that happen. We inventoried all of our data stores, and we knew we didn't know exactly how many there were out there, but we've got them all inventoried. We've prioritized all of that information, and we have started to smart enable it or service enable it, and you heard Al Tarasic um, talking about that earlier today. We are 40% of the way there. Uh, because we are concentrating on the top priority, because we've been able to weed out the redundancies, 40% there. Our goal by July 2013 is to have 100% of our data service enabled in a smart data framework. We've published the standard. And so what does that mean, data smart enabled or service enabled? Metadata tagged, so you've got all the information about the data. It means it's cataloged and it's in accordance with Open Geospatial Consortium standards. So at the end of the day, easy to find. The benefits, of course, we've eliminated redundancy. We're down to one copy of everything, I hope. Um, and you know that reduces storage. We've improved the quality of the data because it's now being tagged. It's in accordance with uh, community standards. And at the end of the day, it reduces the burden on both our analysts and our users in searching for that data. You've heard me say that our analysts spend far too much time looking for the information as opposed to analyzing the information. So huge benefit. But I will tell you the real benefit for the analyst is now with that enabled data, they can overlay different data sets. 
they can begin to see those patterns and trends that we're talking about and make those observations. Moving now to um, the open IT, and I, I will tell you thanks to Al Trasic and Rob Carey for their leadership here. We absolutely must succeed with EyeSight, with the intelligence community, IT enterprise, and with the defense intelligence enterprise, the joint information enterprise that you heard Rob talk about. We have to succeed in order for NGA to achieve our vision. We need that open IT environment. And so that's why I volunteered NGA to work with DIA to create that common desktop environment. And you heard the milestones that Al laid out. We've started testing already, limited numbers between DIA and NGA. But by March 2013, we'll have over 2,000 users on this environment. March 2014, the goal is 60,000 users. And so this enables our analysts, it enables all of us, to log on from any computer, anywhere in the community, and get to your data and your apps. So you got that data smart enabled, you can get to it, you can find it. No more tunneling through networks, no more trying to find uh, a computer that belongs to your own agency wherever you're working. So key to us. Key also, of course, is the work that CIA and NSA are doing on the secure cloud to give us that common infrastructure. Because when we have that, it will enable us to be able to rapidly scale our exploitation and processing capabilities and be able to take advantage of all that is out there. We don't all have to be building it ourselves. Are there challenges here? You bet. And you heard about a lot of the technical challenges and some of the the, the business challenges from the CIO panel, I will tell you some of the challenges that, that we're faced with and we're thinking about is what's the compensation model when you talk about licenses, when you talk about 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 60,000 users, when an app goes viral and you have a license for 10,000, do you cut people off? Is it for 10,000 users or 10,000 concurrent users? Do I have to buy an unlimited license? I will tell you that is unaffordable in today's environment. I'd say it's probably unaffordable in an era of increasing resources. We're certainly not increasing. So we need to work with our industry partners to figure out how we come up with a compensation model that works for both of us. Likewise, as we are teaming more and more as agencies, we're used to the point-to-point -point contracts, a contract between an individual agency and an industry partner. As DIA and NGA are working this common desktop environment, we have multiple contracts with our vendors, and as we try to put them together, we realize there are different terms, some better than others. So um, working through that, it's a challenge. I think it's workable. Now, let's take that service-enabled content and the open IT environment and put them together. I will tell you, when our content is enabled and it's accessible through an open IT environment, now we're talking about the ability to serve yourself. You can access our content, you can tailor it, you can do with it what you need to do. What I ask in return is when you do access it and make enhancements or build a product or add to it, that you share that back with us. That will enable us to learn, that will enable us to provide better service in the future, and in return, we will host it and serve it back out to the entire community. I also want your GeoInt content. I want to host that. Follow our service enabling standard, but we will host that and serve it back out to the rest of the community. So we all benefit from having the ability to access the content in an open environment. I will tell you, exposing our content to tens of thousands of users, we don't know what will happen. It will be things that are unthought of by NGA today, probably unthought of by folks here. We've seen that happen. Challenges? Data volume. 
We've been talking about large data for a while. This becomes even larger. So how do we deal with the volume metrics? Data integrity. DNI Clapper got a question about, D about data integrity. How do we ensure the integrity of data that others will give to us? We've been working on a content maturity model, but I'm sure that we can use your help to further evolve that. Data standards, data stewardship, content management, all things that we have talked about, but as we do expose more and more data and add to that, they become ever important, ever more important. So now I've talked about making our content accessible and you providing your content to us also. That immediately makes our users not only consumers, but also producers. That gets us to that self-service environment that we've been talking about. Because users, as not only consumers, but also producers, are demanding a new reality. They want to be able to serve themselves. And that's exactly what we've been working on this past year. When I was on stage last year, I demonstrated a number of apps that we had developed and that we were working with FEMA and some of the state emergency management agencies. And I'm very pleased to say that we've developed a whole lot more apps and FEMA and the state agencies are working in, they're, they're in between the assisted service and the self-service. They're doing a fair amount themselves. We're still there to help them. Uh, Hurricane Isaac, we did no hard copy production, none. It was all delivered, all of the commercial imagery, and not only um, commercial overhead, but airborne imagery, working with Civil Air Patrol. We were able to incorporate that, deliver that to handheld devices. And using our apps, um, two things came out of that. One, our analysts were able to spend more time actually analyzing. Typically, we would send about 20 folks forward for a natural disaster such as the size of Hurricane Isaac. We sent five. And none actually went all the way into the field. They stayed at sector headquarters. They were able to use some additional applications that we had developed to um, look at and measure the extent of the flooding. And we were able to do that in very short order, deliver that to FEMA, who was then able to make their assessment in 24 to 48 hours and post that on their website. Work that had previously taken them upwards of six to seven weeks, they were able to do in 24 to 48 hours. And I will tell you, that is huge. I speak from personal experience. My little sister lost her house and all of her belongings in Hurricane Isabel. And it took three months for them to find out whether or not they were going to get federal assistance. Huge, game changer. Um, FEMA, it, it, that, that's just working extremely well. Um, another uh, self-service um, application that we've put out there, again, for disaster operations is the ability for folks like FEMA and others to order imagery directly. So um, we have a service that's set up, a, a, a web service, and um, as a, an event is happening, the companies are watching, they're taking a, a bet, certainly, that uh, the imagery will be ordered, but they'll shoot a pre and a post, and it's there automatically delivered to our partners. So um, another great example. I was in Germany last week and met with the NGA support team there, and I got an update on how they've taken some of the applications we developed for disaster support. Um, using them on a mobile device. Uh, military teams out in the field are um, accessing unclassified imagery and taking their observation on the ground, adding to that. So again, a good example of user as producer. So I've talked a little bit about apps. At this point, um, we have about 150 apps in our app store. Al mentioned the app stores that each of the agencies are developing. And of those 150, almost 80% were developed by NGA. So about 20% by industry and our mission partners. By next July, 2013, I'd like to see that almost inverted. I'd like to see others developing 
of those apps and NGA only developing 25%. Why? Because of the innovation, because of the ideas, because of what it is that you all do each and every day. We can concentrate on that exquisite GeoInt. So that's another goal that we have out there, another marker. Challenges. Come back to uh, the, the same as last time, the compensation model. We held our first NGA Industry Day for applications a couple of weeks ago. And during that, we unveiled a proposal. We'd like to get to a compensation model that is a business to business, a B2B application compensation model that is based on commercial standards, that is based on a commercial model. And that is, we would look at, um, we would want developers creating apps speculatively. And then you are compensated based on the rating and the usage. We've incorporated a rating schema, business analytics into our app store, so we are ready to do that. Had very good conversations, and we are hopeful that we will be able to implement such a compensation model. Another challenge there, of course, is training. Training our users, training our own analysts. Um, although, again, DNI Clapper talked to this um, with the younger generations coming up, it's natural. As long as we build them such that they are intuitive to use, it may be less of a training challenge than we anticipate. The fourth and final priority is analysis. Now, Al Tarasik said, and I, he said, don't tell me, but I heard him back in the green room, um, that his favorite of our four priorities is open IT. I will tell you, mine is analysis, and it's actually all four of them. All four are inextricably woven together. We need to be able to do all four in order to succeed in achieving our vision. But the fourth, the analysis, of course, I laid out as one of the two goals in 2010, to deepen and broaden our analysis, to bring in new and different phenomenologies, to use as much information as possible, including human geography information. And so that's exactly what we have been working on. Now, as we approached this, we knew that we needed to really kind of change our thinking and really look at new analytic approaches. And so we created a couple of integrated work groups, integrated working groups. And what we did is we took experts from across all of the occupation sets in NGA. So we took our imagery analysts, both regional and functional. We took our geospatial analysts, our imagery scientists, our R&D folks, IT specialists, HR specialists, trainers, security folks. And we said, OK. We want you, gave them some key intelligence questions and said, OK, we want you to stand back and look at how you would approach this differently. Think about new ways of doing analysis. Think about the tools you would need to do so. Think about who all you need in the room as you work this. And I will tell you, um, what happened is exactly what we hoped would happen the innovation came out. So as the analysts, and let me tell you, you know, functional and regional analysts, they would have like coordinated on a product right before publishing. So get them in the room together, and they start thinking about, well, if we had this, well, if we could only access that. And the collection strategist said, well, yeah, we can probably get you that information. And what if we got you this information also? And the analyst said, well, OK, but then I'd have to be able to do the following. And the R&D folks said, I can build you an app for that. And what has resulted is new collection strategies, new information that we're bringing in that we haven't looked at previously, new applications. And so it, it's exactly what we were hoping for as the integrated work groups have taken off. And if you have heard about the advanced campaign cell, which is actually a DNI initiative, it's kind of the integrated working groups on steroids. It's the integrated working groups looking at a multi-int, looking at it from a multi-int perspective. And so what the uh, integrated working groups, the IWGs, um, are really doing is they are 
they, they are bringing us a new framework, and it is one that, you know, as I mentioned, the advanced campaign cell, I think can really even um, push integration across the community. So, um, one of the first things that the, the IWGs realized is there was a shortfall in the working environment that we had that, again, analysts couldn't get to all the information they needed all in one place with the tools at hand. And so this really um, pushed us to create what we now refer to as the Integrated Analytic Environment, or IAE. It's an application. You get to it through a web browser. Um, simple, but very powerful. So take it back to that content. Contents enabled in one place. Pull apps from the App Store. Create the work process that you need for the job at hand. So it's tailorable. The analyst can set it up however they need to for the task that they're working on that day. Truth in advertising. Um, we've got a couple hundred folks working on it right now. All the content's not there, only 40%. The whole, their whole workflow has not been put in place yet, but we will do so by December 2013. We're doing drops with new capabilities every 60 days. We're about to deliver the fifth drop. And so the analysts are seeing day in and day out changes um, and they're getting what they're asking for as far as the upgrades, as far as exactly what they need. So it's really quite exciting for them. And the basis of the integrated analytic environment is both places and activity. So it's not only the what, it's also the what is happening. And that's, um, that's very key here. So instead of only recording something, we're recording some things over time. So structured observations. We've created a structured observation database in order to capture those. And now you're talking about a database that can be queried, can be manipulated, can be operated upon, and again, overlaying that different type of information. The other change to our analytic approach, activity-based intelligence. Again, not only the, the why, or the, the what, but what is happening. So activity over time. It enables you to paint that picture. It enables you to develop the network, uh, the network of people, the network of places, the network of activities. And so that's another big change into how we're doing our business. Likewise, the introduction, or continued, I should say, continued introduction of human geography information. Um, the, the, the DNI spoke to this. He, he recently um, appointed, appointed, recently asked NGA to take on executive agency for the community so that we can better organize, again, put standards out there for what the data elements are and how they should be structured. And so we have brought this very different and disparate community together and have begun to do just that. Challenges. Well, culture. You know, different folks working together, um, asking them to approach problems from a different perspective. Uh, but I will tell you, when folks are seeing change and seeing what's being delivered almost on a daily basis, um, the culture isn't as hard as, as you might think. Synchronization of content. As we're moving from static products to dynamic products, as we're moving from um, static products to inter interactive, you know, allowing the user to tailor what they want, as you have a new observation, a new piece of information, how do you ensure that that ripples through all of the products that are out there? So how do we synchronize our content as we bring in new content between living products, if you will? Um, Tradecraft training, as we introduce new phenomenologies, as we introduce new types of information. Tradecraft training, analyst certification. Um, challenges, I look at them as opportunities. Opportunities for us to partner together and take GeoInt to the next level. 
So I will say in closing, you know, I've highlighted some of the progress that we've made over the last year, and we really have made some, some tremendous progress. We are delivering more robust content. We have developed and are finishing that, the integrated analytic environment. We are introducing new analytic methodologies, and at the end of the day, I think we're delivering better GeoInt. Are we finished? Not by a long shot. There is much less left to do. There are many challenges out there, and that's why we need a community such as this, a community that has as much talent and capability as you all have. Help me help us transform GeoInt. Help us continue to create tomorrow's NGA today. Thank you. I just want to point out that all she has to do is be director of NGA. I have to sort through 200 <laughs> questions on the fly and try to make sense of them. Uh, clearly a lot of appetite for Q&A this morning, and we will try to get through as many of these as we can. Director Long, you took over an agency a little over two years ago that your predecessors had focused largely but not exclusively on improving the current ops tempo and support to customers, military customers on the battlefield, as well as policy makers and platform uh, manufacturers. You've, also, you've laid out a vision now that's very ambitious for how to modernize um, geospatial intelligence across both your organization but the rest of the community. How do you deal with the tensions inherent in uh, trying to continue the extraordinary level of support that NGA provides its customers while you take things like your integrated work groups into the mainstream of the agency? I love a challenge. <laughs> um, it, you know, it, it, the theme of this conference is creating the innovation edge. Um, and the great video that we had this morning talks about the fact that we are who we are, we continue to, to push the edge. Um, I, I had a great foundation upon which to continue to move GeoInt. I mean, Admiral Dantone got the agency started. General King really brought the tribes together. DNI Clapper created GeoInt. He brought the imagery and the mapping um, together to what was um, really the purpose of creating NEMA to begin with. And then Admiral Moret, rightly so, put us on a wartime footing. As I came into the job, I knew we were in a good place, but I was focused on the future. How were we going to remain in a good place? How were we going to remain on the top of our game and continue to provide that exquisite GeoInt? We are always building the plane as we are flying it, so to say. And so we will continue to deliver to our varied customer set what they need, when they need it, how they need it, but we've got to be thinking about the future. We've got to be continually um, pushing ourselves so that we do remain at the forefront. Are there inherent tensions? Sure, but I think we, we learn from what we provide each and every day. All right, a lot of questions, as you might expect, around commercial imagery and the future of commercial imagery. Many in the audience would like to know uh, how you see the current uh, um, effort to combine the two primary commercial imagery providers uh, progressing. Do you support that merger? What concerns do you have about it? And what do you see as, as the future of commercial imagery in the GeoInt world? I, I see the future of commercial imagery as an enduring part of our architecture. Nothing has changed in that respect. As we have sized our our current and future um, overhead architectures, we have um, set aside X amount of requirements for commercial imagery. Um, I, I see that as an enduring part that, that will continue to remain. I mean, what is happening between um, the two companies, you know, as the, the DNI said, we're supporting uh, questions that we get from Department of Justice and DOD. 
And so, um, you know, we will continue to answer those questions as we get them, but I think what is key is it is an enduring part of our architecture. I mean, the ability that we have to use the commercial imagery, to share it with our coalition partners, to use it with first responders, um, as well as what we do in um, what is known as the, the Multinational Geospatial Co-Production Program. It's a consortium, a consortium, a consortium of about 30 countries um, where we share uh, the commercial imagery and others create foundation data and mapping products. So for each you know, um, cell that they produce, they get 10 in return. Same for us, we don't have to do it all. Um, so we are working with our international partners there. So an enduring part of the architecture. Number of questions related to, uh, and we heard this earlier in both the CIO panel and for Director Clapper, but talking about integration of uh, other government agencies and allowing them to access um, NGA data, for example, USAID, but also interest in cooperation with partners outside of the U.S. and how we see uh, NGA uh, continuing to partner and even enhancing its partnership and the bilateral cooperation which you talked about in your remarks. However, specifically the European Union Satellite Center, how will NGA interface with it? Uh, specifically the EU Satellite Center, we, we do um, work with them today and, and again I see that continuing. I mean, we can't do what we do on our own. Um, the, the CIO panel got a question about the architecture and how that will, um, and are we thinking about our allies? And the answer is absolutely. I mean, as we build out our open IT architecture, we have a companion piece um, for uh, our closest allies. And so, you know, you take somebody like the EU Satellite Center, they have something to offer. I mean, there are many, um, countries out there that are building and launching satellites. And so I think the more we can share and the more we can learn from one another, the better off we're going to be. A lot of questions about uh, specifically how will NGA do deal with budget cuts. You've laid out um, a somewhat costly vision for how to integrate uh, information across the geospectral, geospatial uh, environment. How do you deal with not just the potential for sequestration, but also the programmed budget cuts? Can you still make progress? So, uh, you know, referring again back to DNI Clapper, I mean, if sequestration happens in the way it's set out today, it absolutely will be devastating. It doesn't give us the flexibility to shape it. It doesn't give us the ability to um, prioritize. It doesn't give us the ability to manage the risk. So if I can put that aside and just talk about the, the, the specter or the possibility of, of, of budget reductions and being able to deal with them in maybe a more logical way, our vision is all about being ready for this. Our vision is all about um, efficiencies and and doing things in a more efficient way. I mean, enabling our content. Let's have one copy of it, one authoritative copy of it. I don't need to store it, you know, at the headquarters level and at the regional level and at the local level five times over. Let's store it once, cut down on storage, cut down on the ability to find things. And so then analysts are working more efficiently. The open IT environment. You heard both the DNI and Al Tarasic talk about um, the fact that we believe that this architecture will save money at the end of the day. Oh, by the way, it'll also be more secure. And so while we have laid out what seems to be, what is an ambitious program, um, at the end of the day, it should be a lot more efficient than the way we're doing business today. A number of questions uh, or comments around your goal of having 75% of your apps developed uh, by industry in the future. Uh, questions about how does industry uh, become exposed to what goes on in the integrated working group so we can help reach that goal? How do small businesses 
uh, participate in achieving that goal of 75% of apps? And how do you retool your acquisition process to make achieving that goal possible? Um, so we do have uh, some folks supporting us now in the integrated work group. So you, part of the way you do that is through the traditional um, uh, contracts that, are, that you have already supporting us. Um, we're very big on the mentor-protege program. And so really working a lot uh, with small businesses through um, some of the bigger companies, but also we have a very robust small business program office. And so I would encourage you to work through our, our small business program office um, if you're not um, being able to make um, headway, if you will. We also have an industry interaction program, again, that uh, Jim Clapper referred to. And so we are always looking for innovators. We are always looking for the new ideas. And I would just encourage you to be vocal uh, about that. We've uh, heard from the CIOs this morning about cloud computing, and there's a lot of activity going on inside the community regarding going to the cloud. Both NSA and NRO have major initiatives. What is NGA's plan regarding cl cloud computing, and what technology gaps exist that need to be addressed regarding the cloud? So we've actually already moved to the cloud. Um, we had the benefit of our BRAC initiative with NGA Campus East, and with that, a new tech center, and we were able to virtualize just about all of our systems and applications in our new environment. And so we actually are already operating in the cloud, largely, not fully, but largely. Um, the differences will be the security protocols and the security construct that NSA is developing. And so I don't know the specifics of the gaps between, but I think we're actually in a pretty good place to um, import what NSA and CIA will develop. There's been um, talk in the past about borders between what was geospatial and what was MAZENT. Can you update the audience on where we are in working across those borders and how do you see signatures relevant to geoint exploitation? You know, I, I will tell you, I don't so much see the borders. I mean, to me, it's about the data. It's about the content. And so whether it's geoint or mazint or sigint or humant, I mean, the way we look at it, everything's in a place in time. Um, everything's in a place at, at a point in time. And so we look to geospatially enable that information whether it's, as I said, SIGINT or HUMANT or even MASINT information. And so the key is, you know, having the ability, having that open IT environment, having the data accessible and being able to take advantage of the computing that will be available from the cloud. Um, I, I think it's less about making the distinctions and it's much more about working in a multi-int environment. Working in a multi-int environment from the beginning how can we use the, the spectrum, no pun, okay, maybe pun intended, no pun intended, how can we use the spectrum to go after our hard problems? How can we task from a multi imp perspective up front and not just as we get the data on the back end? So how can we bring all of the sensors to bear on a problem set up front with innovative collection strategies going after those hard problems and then taking advantage of all of the data and information at the end. Can you talk about your efforts to implement strong functional management as, and, and the uh, intelligence community's involvement in uh, helping to define what GeoInt products and services are needed for the future? What is that uh, integration of GeoInt from an NGA perspective out to the intelligence community and then the larger user community that you serve? So from a functional management perspective, and I often get the question, you know, do you have enough authorities? And, you know, after looking at this for two years, I think the answer is yes. I mean, we have the, all the authorities we need. It's, it's now executing those authorities. I mean, the ability to set standards is huge. 
have to make sure people are actually abiding by the standards. And that was one thing that we actually weren't doing. So we would write these standards, we would publish these standards, and then wonder why some of the data was not interoperable with our data. Well, it's because we weren't, we weren't um, participating in program reviews to ensure that the standards were actually being followed. We're doing that now. We've begun kind of a march through all of the GEOINT programs within the intelligence community and the Department of Defense to review with the um, individuals um, their program. Actually, we are putting the standards out there and they're doing the review and giving us the report card back. So um, we've completed Air Force. Army is um, underway in the data collection phase and CIA is next. And the feedback we got from Air Force was, thanks. We found programs we didn't know we had. We found folks who were working on the same thing and they didn't know each other was doing it. And oh, by the way, we found a few things that we weren't in compliance with. And I, I mean, to me, that's, that's the best feedback that we can get. And as I said, we took the approach, here's what we want you to look at. You review yourself and come back and give us the feedback. And as we've completed the first one, the rest of the community is saying, well, we need to be a part of that too. And you know, General James and I said, well, of course, why not? Why wouldn't we share what we learned as we did the Air Force review with everyone else? And so we will be doing that as we march through the future ones. So you know, I, I think we are making progress in the functional management um, arena. And I don't remember the rest of the question. I don't either. But that was a great answer, so we'll, we'll cut it off there. Uh, we've been, we focused this morning, and rightly so, on the effects of reductions. NGA arguably has um, one of the best, okay, I'll say it, the best relationship uh, of all of the IC agencies with the industry that supports it and has done a tremendous job of bringing, broadening that industry base and bringing it into uh, service in the, in the geospatial world. When you think about and look at reductions that are uh, both already programmed and possible, how do you think about that integrated geospatial capability when you start to contemplate cuts? So one of the first things I think about is the self-serve environment. If the data is enabled and we have an open IT environment and you can get to it, that's less that I need to do. That's some of the basics. Um, it's even beyond the basics in the assisted arena where you can get to the information, you can use an app or two or three or five um, with it, but you get to a point where you need some assistance. So you find the expert at NGA or across the GeoInt enterprise. As we develop this integrated analytic environment, one of the benefits, and there are many, but one of the benefits are that all of the GeoInt analysts out there can have insight to what one another is working on. So if we've got a problem somewhere in the world, I don't have somebody at headquarters, at CENTCOM, at Office of Naval Intelligence, at Fifth Fleet, all working on the same issue, unless we want them working on the same issue. Today, folks don't know what others are working on. They don't know in real time what key intelligence questions are being asked and answered, and there's still a lot of point-to-point -point solutions. So I firmly believe that we need to continue to protect the resources to invest in the achieving of our vision, because at the end of the day, as I said, we're gonna be a lot more efficient and a lot more effective, and we're gonna be able to take advantage of this entire enterprise. Director Long, you have a, a huge responsibility to support ongoing operations, and we talked about how NGA has improved its ability over the, the life of its existence in, in providing that support. You've also laid out an ambitious uh, vision for how you want to uh, take the agency forward in the future. Given the, the uh, environment that we are in and is likely to get worse, what are the one or two or three things that you are most concerned about that could uh, take you off the path of your on, you're on in achieving this vision? 
Well, I'd have to say the top um, concern would be sequestration. I mean, there, there's you know, no question about that. Um, significant budget reductions um, also. Act, you know, any budget reduction, you know, any agency direct, director is, is not going to be happy with. Um, I, I, you know, again, I, I'd, I'd flip it the other way and say, you know, that I'm always looking for the opportunities. So I'm looking for the opportunity to partner because it, at the end of, end of the day, the whole of us working together in an integrated fashion is much more than the sum of the parts. And I firmly believe that together we can continue to deliver the best GeoInt possible. Director Long, thank you for being here today. Thank you for your support of this industry. Thank you for your leadership. Great job. Really good.